Our first speaker is Professor Nasli Kibria. Nasli is Professor of Sociology and currently the Chair of the Sociology Department. She te teaches courses on the sociology of international migration, families, childhood, and contemporary South Asia. A scholar of global migration, families, and identity formations, her recent books include Muslims in Motion, Islam and National Identity in the Bangladeshi Diaspora, and Race and Immigration with Kara Bowman and Megan O'Leary. Current projects include a study of transnational families with special needs children and another on race, Muslims, and media portrayals of the Boston Marathon bombers. Please welcome Professor Kibria. Good evening. Very happy to be here and to see you all here this evening. So as we all know, Muslim Americans are a focus of a lot of public interest today. There is a way in which they are hyper-visible. And of course, we've seen this in some of the ongoing dramas of the, of the current presidential campaign, um, as highlighted by the remarks of Donald Trump, which I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, about Muslims and not letting them into the US. The hyper-visibility of Muslims today has a strongly negative component. Many, though certainly not all Americans, are fearful about Islam as a threat to America, and they associate Muslims with terrorism, war, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and so forth. And according to a Pew survey, for example, about 50% of Americans say that Islam encourages violence more than other religions. And another survey shows 61% of Americans expressing unfavorable views of Islam. So an important idea, part of this idea of Islam and negative difference, is that the approximately 3.3 million is Muslims who live in America all hold fundamentally different values from core American ones, which makes, them, makes it difficult or even impossible for Muslims to integrate into America. In fact, this story of Muslim immigrant separation and difference does not really hold up to the social science evidence. In fact, I would argue that what we have so far, at least, is a story of integration, of becoming part of the pluralistic landscape of America. And I would also say that it's quite a different story from the Muslim European one with which it's often compared. The key to the story of Muslims becoming American is to understand that it's not a story of one single path, but of a variety of pathways. These divergent pathways of integration reflect many variables, but one of the most important things to consider is how diverse the Muslim American population is across almost every social variable that you can imagine. And the stand-up com comic uh, Azar Osman uh, has a great skit um, in, um, in the show, uh, Allah Made Me Funny, in which he describes all of the different ways in which Muslims say, Salaam Alaikum, which is the greeting, which means peace be with you. But if we start looking at the, so the sociological data, the social science data, we see that there is diversity among Muslim Americans by social class. Um, there is, um, it's a heavily immigrant population, but not exclusively so. 13% of US Muslims are African Americans whose parents were born in the US. There are also growing numbers of second generation US born Muslim Americans. And I think it's also notable that a very high percentage, uh, about 80% of um, immigrant Muslims are US citizens, naturalized US citizens. So um, that's something that Donald Trump should think about um, as we enter into the election season. And of course, we know that Muslims, immigrant Muslims are from many different regions and countries of the world. Um, from the Middle East and North Africa, from South Asian countries like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and also from Sub-Saharan Africa. So what we have is a really diverse population that includes immigrants, the US born, people with different racial identifications, ethnic identifications, and so forth. 
Furthermore, from what we know, there is also a lot of diversity in terms of levels of religiosity among Muslim Americans. There is a widely held assumption that a Muslim identity automatically means high levels of religiosity and religious practice uh, as measured by things like um, pray, prayer or attending mosque and so forth. But in fact, all of the available data show that there's a lot of diversity in terms of le levels of religiosity. So all of these diversities feed into what I call the multiple identity pathways of Muslim Americans, or the divergent ways in which they negotiate what it means to be Muslim and American today. So what are these pathways? The, the one pathway, the first pathway, which I think is very important to talk about because it's so invisible, is what I call the private faith and practice pathway. This involves those who identify as Muslims, but see it largely as a matter of private faith and practice, something that they largely confine to themselves and their families. They do not make their faith a publicly visible part of their lives in that they do not necessarily attend or participate in mosques or Muslim associations regularly, and their friendships and social networks are not centered on relationships with fellow Muslims. This does not mean that religious belief and practice, whether it is prayer or fasting during Ramadan, are dismissed as unimportant, but it's more that they're seen as very private and individual matters. So this pathway of becoming Muslim American involves the development of a privatized, compartmentalized approach to one's Muslim identity. Another pathway, which I call the ethnic American pathway, is also public, publicly invisible, but in a different way. Here the emphasis is on one's regional or national origin roots, for example, being Arab American or Somali American, and being Muslim is seen as part of this, embedded in it, and in fact, inseparable from it. So in my research on Bangladeshi Muslim Americans, I found my informants telling me that it was by cultivating a Bangladeshi identity that one also cultivated a Muslim identity. There was a strong sense of the importance of maintaining a sense of Bangladeshi identity in America and cultivating it in a variety of ways, whether it was through choice of marriage partner, community involvements, and so forth. Religious faith and practice were also important and often involved participation in and support for Bangladeshi Muslim mosques and associations. So in terms of American traditions of pluralism, those on this ethnic American pathway understood themselves as becoming ethnic Americans, like Italian American, Chinese American, with national origins being a primary point of reference and being Muslim folded into it. Uh, inseparable from it, entwined with it. And then we have the pan-Muslim pathway, which is about active engagement in Islamic faith and practice. Being Muslim here was, was seen here as the primary dominant axis of identity and community, of far greater importance than region, ethnicity, or national origins. It's not surprising that this is the pathway that's received the most public scrutiny, and it's been held up as the Muslim American pathway, although it's actually one of many. While the pan-Muslim pathway is often seen as a pathway of separation for Muslims, my own research and that of others shows that it is often, especially for second-generation Muslim immigrants, a pathway of integration or becoming part of American society. It is a way of being American, a way of m moving away from the traditions and sensibilities of immigrant parents and towards an identity and way of life that is inclusive and democratic. So second generation Bangladeshi Muslims who followed this pathway spoke of being part of an American Muslim community that crossed over racial and ethnic lines. They talked about gender equality, volunteerism, community service, and active political participation as Muslim American values. 
So the identities of Muslim and American were woven together for them. So in their own way, all of three of the pathways that I've described, the private faith and practice pathway, the ethnic American pathway, and the pan-Muslim pathway are all stories of becoming American. So what is happening is so far from the simplistic and often hateful ideas that are in the public sphere today about Muslim Americans. So it's really time, I think, for the story of Muslim American integration to get out and become known. Thank you. So I guess there's uh, a few minutes for questions, if people have questions. Um, how do you think the recent Burkini, um, hello, how do you think the recent Burkini um, issue in France is affecting Muslim Americans? Right. So the, the question is about the, uh, the French um, controversy, you know, over the Burkini. I think, you know, I think certainly one of the, one of the, the complicated things is that Muslim Americans are affected by these global trends of you know, what's happening in France, what's happening in Ger Germany, and so forth. And the Burkini, the Burkini controversy, really once again, it highlights Muslim difference. And I think that is one of the ways in which it affects, affects Muslim Americans here. But um, certainly in this country, there is not the same, you know, there are traditions that really negate against the idea of such a thing as, a, you know, a Burkini ban. So I think that people are also really conscious of that as well. Yes. So. Hi, uh, thank you. That was a really interesting talk. Um, my question, you brought up at the beginning the comparison between um, Muslim um, populations in Europe and in the United States. So what do you think that Europe can learn from US integration or vice versa? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think that the um, Muslim European uh, situation is very different in part because the history is very different in um, countries like, uh, for example, in Germany, uh, Muslims have uh, Muslims have are largely of Turkish origin, uh, and they've also, uh, as we see particularly um, powerfully in France, there's a sense in which they have been really economically marginalized and segregated, you know, into particular areas and into sort of economically kind of impoverished. Impoverished, impoverished situations. Um, in, in the US, however, because there's been such a diverse entry of Muslims from different backgrounds, national backgrounds, different flows, people who settled in different parts of the country and from different backgrounds, you really don't have those kinds of pockets, pockets of segregation. So it's very, very different. Hi there. Um, so I think often, t well, I would say that um, this blind hatred comes from ignorance. So how do you educate a population who doesn't want to listen? How do you interrupt that cycle of just blind following in this ignorance, thus hatred? Yeah, I think that you know, as I, um, you know, as I hope I try to convey in this talk, one one way is to get the story out that this is not what people are thinking of this population that's just kind of keeping to itself and not changing. Um, you know, that may be one segment of it, small segment of it, but it's not, it's not sort of a, a, a general sort of condition. I think that we need to see more um, music, art, 
theater, writings, I see, I see that, you know, the area of arts and culture as being sort of a prime place for really to get this story out. And I referred to my, you know, one of my famous, um, one of my famous, one of my favorite comedians. I think, you know, Muslim comedy, American Muslim comedy, which is such a, you know, those of you who haven't seen any, I invite you to, to look it up. You know, wonderful comedy that is really kind of trying to penetrate, you know, some of these ideas. Hi, um, if you could advise Americans who have been bombarded with anti-Muslim and anti-immigration themes in the media on how to properly approach the issue of mass immigration from Muslim countries to the United States, for example, from Syria, Somalia, and Bangladesh, um, to prevent the spread of fear and bigotry, how would you advise Americans to go about the issue of mass immigration? How, uh, how would I advise them in terms of an immigration policy or? Uh, Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, you know, certainly, um, you know, I think that the immigration sort of um, tests and controls that have been put in place are sort of, you know, um, they're very extensive. And, um, you know, the idea of obviously of a, of a test of religion and religious belief and some of the ideas, unfortunately, that have been tossed around now, uh, tossed around in the, in the political campaign now about seeing whether Muslims coming in, you know, have the right values, core American values, you know, I think that those would be sort of very dangerous ideas, um, you know, to, to put forward as policy. But I'm not sure, you know, exactly if that's what you're getting at or... Thank you.